Hello, extra time. You point to the league not to get a hold because it, it damages your reputation. It, it makes people, when they read it, just laugh at you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Extime.com podcast. Your host, Luke Jordan. Did I say Don Ryan and Ashley Hannah? And I'm saying again, guys, how are we? What's the crack, lads? How are we? We're good. Coming up on today's show, we chat the P Mounts climbing only about the season so far. A little later on, Don like catch up with former Irish and 21 international Jake O'Brien, who's currently on loan with Belgian side Mullenbeck. But first, a quick run through the SSE Air Tristy League results, starting with the Premier Division. On Friday night, we had Shells 1, Dundalk 1, St. Pat's 0, Rovers 2, Drotty United 0, Bowes 2, Cork City 1, Derry City 3. And on Saturday night, we had Sligo Rovers 3, UCD 1. I suppose Don will start itself again, obviously, come down to Sligo Rovers game. We said last week it was a must-win game for Sligo and they, they got the job done. Yeah, absolutely, Luke. And a fantastic win as well. I know UCD probably didn't really leave too much to the imagination in terms of creating chances or whatever, but they still managed to score a goal. And at the start of the second half, they were certainly doing their best to get back into the game. But overall, it was a very controlled, professional performance from Sligo Rovers. And no doubt John Russell will be really happy with that. I mean, the first half, Rovers were streets ahead of UCD. And 10 corners alone in the first half kind of says it all, really. You know, two assists for Caelan Barlow as well on his return to the starting lineup. And James Finnerty as well, who was making his first start of the season, hadn't kicked the ball so far and only came in in the 11th game and looked like he's been there all year. So, very impressive debut for him from Sligo Rovers. And of course, Max Mata getting his eighth goal of the season, keeping him clear at the top of the goal scoring charts as well. But the man of the match was undoubtedly for Breeze Hartman. I mean, the lad, he's on loan from RB Leipzig. Um, it's just a matter of time of how long we can Rovers will be able to hang on to him, I'd say. So it's, it's just a case of enjoy him while he's in the league. because And if you haven't seen him, get a chance to watch him, lads, because he is a top, top talent. But yeah, excellent win for Sligo Rovers and kind of keeps him in touch and distance in the race for Europe as well. I know it's kind of early on to be throwing that out there, but um, it's a priority for Rovers to kind of get it in towards the top four this year after missing out last year. So um, yeah, overall, a pretty good weekend for everyone concerned with Sligo Rovers. Yeah, and just on hand, we were chatting off air. Obviously, great goal as well. Yeah, you know he's a he's an he's a he's a box of tricks. Like you know, like we've seen, I'm sure you've seen snippets of him that the League of Ireland account will be putting up of uh, you know little tricks and flicks that he has here and there. But he's really starting to get into the groove now. You know, his ter- he got got two goals against UCD there last Saturday night, and that's three for him so far this season. And um, coming in with a couple of assists as well. So you know. When he gets going, he's an absolute joy to watch. Like he gets fans up off their seats. Like he, like I, I said, I made a comparison. He's like something off FIFA, you know. So um, yeah, he's an absolute top talent. And like I said, if you if you haven't seen him yet playing, try and get a chance to because he is absolutely top class. I say the only goal that probably beats uh for Brees's goal this this week it has to be the Trevor Clark strike, unfortunately, which was against Pats. It was some goal. Yeah, and we were just looking at it there before we started recording. Um, I know Ashling fairly enjoyed it as well, but I just couldn't believe the power he generated. Like, you know, he was pretty much standing right over the ball and to get as much power behind that and keep it accurate as well. An absolute crack and strike. Def- de- will definitely be in the runner for goal of the month, if not goal of the season. Yeah, and it's amazing as well, just on Shamrock Rovers, how oh, five weeks ago, there was talk of Rovers, blah, blah, not, not starting well. Issues, errors missing over the case and B. Last five games, four wins and a draw. Sitting on 18 points, six point balls and, and in great form now. Yeah, well, you know, Shamrock Rovers kind of usually start slow and then kind of grow into us, you know, kind of Manchester City esque in that in that regard. But um, you know, like a, we had Brian Marsro on the podcast last week as well, and he kind of highlighted their their kind of slow start and disciplinary issues really kind of hampered them at the start of the season. But I don't think there was ever a sense or anyone ever really thought that Shamrock Rovers would be down the wrong end of the table for too long. Like it was always kind of in the back of everyone's mind that they'd be able to string a run together because if any team can in the League of Ireland, it's Shamrock Rovers. And um, they were always going to kind of get back up towards the top of the table, and they're certainly kind of kicking into gear now. I suppose the game on the TV last week, RT, were showing shells, Dundalk, Donald caught the game. Bit of controversy in the first half, you mentioned. Yeah, and um, in the opening stages, a penalty to to Dundalk was given. Uh, Andrew Quinn took out uh, Ryan Tullock, and um, correct decision in my eyes. Uh, of course, there was a bit of protesting with the referee as well, and um, Shane Farrell. Absolutely ludicrous red card from a Shelburne point of view. I mean, he's standing literally two yards away from the referee and he raises a hand to Keith Ward's face like 
you know, people would say kind of that's kind of been happening a lot this season where you've seen Reds given for uh, hands being raised. I know there was a lot of debate about Roberto Lopez getting sent off in the showgrounds in the first game of the season. But, you know, when you, like players know if you raise a hand to someone, it's a red card. So I like there's no there's no debate. And again, was the correct decision to send Shane Farrell off on the replay. Uh, Robbie Benson steps up to take the penalty and an excellent save from Connor Kearns to take it out or to keep to keep it out rather and um, obviously you know the game was just a, a fantastic it was fantastic it was great to see uh, such an entertaining game being picked for one of the TV games and then um, yeah I think draw probably fares up in the end Yeah I think it was a surprise when you mentioned the TV selection I think a lot of people was assuming it was going to be Pats Rovers due to the fact that there every 5,000 seats but thankfully like I suppose one of the complaints I've had over the years, sometimes RT can pick a dead rubber or whatever the case would be. They always seem to pick the wrong game. But thankfully, it was a decent game. Uh, just before you move on, a bit more, I suppose you mentioned Conor Kearns there and I suppose Dane Duff after the match having his, his, his weekly, um, I suppose, controversial comment on the way you want to say. Every week he seems to say something that the media catch on to and he was saying Conor Kearns now is the best keeper in the league. What do you think? Is he is he right on that one or is he just kind of trying to boost his players' uh, confidence? Um, he's I, I I don't think Conor Cairns is the best keeper in the league. He's a good keeper, all right, but I think it, there's no nobody near Brian Maher in terms of ability and talent. You know, you can make an argument for Alan Manis, but you know, not getting any younger, probably past it now at this stage. But for me, Brian Maher is absolutely straight ahead and as the best keeper in the league so far. But like you know, Damien Duff's gonna do what Damien Duff does. Like this is fairly common common practice for him at this stage and you know when whenever Shelburne are on the TV the cameras there's only more cameras on Duff than there is on the football yeah. that's one, one, one thing I've noticed in the coverage lately but um, you know he's going to come out and he's going to make statements like that He, that's just the way that's his management style and you know it gets Shelburne up like it gets them up for the games like you know they, they did a great job in staying up last year that was surely their primary objective and you know I was reading today that he was saying aim big like we got to aim for the stars like there's no reason why we can't make Europe so you know I'm sure this isn't the last uh, time we'll be talking about Damien Duff's quotes after a match on this podcast. There is really a touch about Josie about him, isn't there? It's just there's there's a you can tell he was he's a former Josie player and the way he handles the media just just yeah to touch of Josie on him. Anyway, uh, we'll move on uh, to the first division and the results from last weekend: Waterford four, Athlone Town three, Westford nil, Finn Harris one, Cole Rammers one, three e one, Galway four, Kerry one, and Longford Town one. Ray won uh, and as we record on Monday night that was the Monday night game it was 3 United 1 Waterford 4 Ashley I suppose we've got our weekly round about the first division Waterford together high flying and Roland Cochran in particular yeah, Ronan Cochran, four goals in the first half, um, looking really solid and he's after scoring a hat-trick there tonight so um, that, that's you know a brilliant run that's five goals now or five wins, sorry, under Keith Long for Watford. So um, looking really strong there. And um, at loan, obviously, the comeback was on, but it wasn't meant to be for them. So um, it was 4-3 with 20 minutes to go. So Watford, in fairness, did well to hold out because I'm sure at loan were going, all guns blazing there at the end. So, um, yeah, fair play to at loan, trying to, trying to come up against them there. And again, Ashley, we're actually looking a bit inconsistent there. We were, we were chatting a bit last week about them and again, losing one near the Finn Harp, they'll be at this point over that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, as you say, Luke, inconsistency is is kind of what's going on at Wexford at the minute. Um, some good games and some not some good results, but um, Finn Harp's getting the win there, 1-0 and Ferry Gary again. It was no goal in the end. Um, James Crawford, he actually looked really good. Um, he played really well, especially the first half, but um wasn't meant to be for Wexford but they had so many chances in the first half and um, we were saying last week about the formation so James Keddy has actually changed up the formation he have Ethan Boyle sort of playing a little bit more um, forward now rather than his usual kind of centre back role he was playing a little bit higher up the pitch and it worked well uh, Aaron Dobbs um, up front on his own Dobbs had so many chances in the first half and he came so close but um yeah, it was uh, one of Finn Harps in the end. Danny Furlong came on in the last few minutes trying to get some sort of attacking power there, trying to get the equaliser. It was actually his 250th appearance for Wexford, so really massive achievement for Danny. But um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't Wexford's night in the end. And the Galway winning streak continues, 10 out of 10, 30 points, the perfect 10. Yeah, I don't think they can be caught, to be honest. I know Watford are creeping up there. Watford about seven points behind them now. But um, also, 
a fair play to Kerry for going one nil up. We were saying um last week about Kerry and how they're really looking stronger for every week, and it'll be it won't be long until they get a win, I would say. Um, but yeah, fair play to them go one nil up on Galway, but um Galway equalized just before half time and then of course it ended four one. So ten wins in a row, really impressive. And the women's pair division then will go through the results from last weekend also. Galway United 2, Sligar Rovers 1, Treaty United 0, DLR Ways 0, P Mount 2, Wexford Youths 1, Shamrock Rovers 4, Bows 0. Record attendance that day as well, by the way, in the women's pair division. Record there was set. What was the attendance? Just over 1,100, guys, was it? 1,111, yeah. And the other game was Athlone Town 2, Cork City 0. Get in touch. You can email us at extratimelive at gmail.com or tag us on Instagram using the hashtag League of Ireland or tweet us at Extra Time News. Let's do it. And now we're delighted to welcome onto the show Team on United defender Chloe Maloney. Chloe, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good in the weekend, saying flying for him. Yeah, it was a good win. Um, tough game as always against Rexford. Um we were actually we were one 0 down at half time, so it was good to get a better performance in the second half and uh, grind out the win. You must be delighted with the start of the season so far, winning six the first seven games. Yeah, um, we're happy enough where we are at the minute. Uh, obviously, we still have uh, a lot to improve on. Um, we obviously lost four one to Shelburne as well, which was very disappointing for our, for us. But um, look, we bounced back um, in the last two games against Cork and uh, Wexford, but. The league is completely different this year. Um, like every team is capable of beating each other. So you've probably seen yourself that the score difference and stuff between teams is just non it's like it's nothing compared to last year. So every game is kind of one nil, two one and stuff, which is great for the league as well. Um but yeah, no game is easy. I say were you, were you taken aback a bit by the Shelburne game, possibly? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, obviously, Shelburne and Piedmont is always a huge, huge game, and it's one you always want to win. But we actually we were one nil up in the game. Um, but it just completely fell apart for us in the second half. But uh, we can't dwell on that too much. I'm just happy with our reaction. Um, but it was very disappointing at the time, and then we obviously went into a two week break, so it was a bit frustrating to have them to wait that long to put it right again. But thankfully, we've uh, bounced back. And Chloe, do you think Piedmont kind of flew in under the radar a bit before the season got underway? Obviously, a lot was made of Shamrock Rovers signing a lot of players from around the league, notably a few going from Piedmont over the road to Tala as well. Like you must have been, was there, was there a bit of kind of concern before before a ball was kicked about how you were going to fare this season just among yourselves? Um, no, I wouldn't think so. Um, I actually think we would have always had great confidence in ourselves as a team obviously players come and go and stuff and that was a lot of the talk around the place was who we were actually losing rather than who we were bringing in and we've brought in great girls into our team that have fit in perfect for us um obviously we have lost some good players too but we can't kind of dwell on that either but um no we would have never actually had much concern about how we would have kind of went out in the league. Uh, we were just went back into pre-season as a, a group and there was obviously new girls in and we just tried to gel as much as we could and get things right for the start of the league. And I think we've done a really good job in that. Um, obviously, we've Karen Duggan is our captain now as well and she played a big part in putting a lot of confidence into us as a team and getting us together again properly. And obviously with James staying on as well um, was a huge thing for us. But I think there was a lot of people who were probably talking that Piedmont were finished and Piedmont were gone because we lost a few players. But that hasn't been the case at all. And it's never really been spoken about in our group. It's just always about the next game, really. And yeah, just looking ahead to the next game, it is Shamrock Rovers. Obviously, they're um, they're uh, four points behind you. Um, and like I said, you know, there's a lot made of players leaving P-Mount to go to Shamrock Rovers. How are you looking ahead to that one? Like, is it a bit of a grudge match? Or, you know, are you just kind of, I guess, just taking it the the typical one game at a time kind of approach? Um, Yeah, like, I suppose people will think that we're going to be going out <laughs> trying to do this and that or whatever, but it's just another game for us. And it's probably, a, it's a top of the table clash at the minute uh, with the way things are going. 
like they do still have a game in hand so there's like there's not much between us at all so it's a huge huge game as is every other game but we're just taking it as another another game like I me personally I wouldn't be getting caught up too much in that kind of stuff um it's just about going out and trying to win the game and concentrate on actually getting them three points yeah and so it's not a matter of obviously it. oh sorry you want that one point. sorry look so it's not really a matter of having a, a point to prove as such then Chloe um well no not really like I think like we've been doing our own bit and stuff and obviously the game is going to be built up to a big uh the biggest game because obviously girls have left us to go to them and stuff like that but we're just going to take it as another game we just like we just want to win um whether it's Shamrock Rovers or whether it's Cork City or whoever we're playing we just want three points so hopefully that we don't get caught up in a lot of it I know probably the crowd and stuff might and whatever else but we're just looking looking at it as another game and just try to get the win yeah, and Donald touched on just a few minutes ago about the obviously the players coming out from P Man going to, to Shamrock Rovers. Obviously one of them we playing at the weekend is Anya Gorman. Like just from the outside looking in, she would seem like a, a huge loss to the dressing room for any dressing room, really. Yeah, of course. And Anya was was my captain in P Mount for, for years and I've huge respect for Anya and I always will. Um I'd be good friends with Anya as well. And that was her decision to go and that's there's no no grudges really held. It's just we just needed to move on without her now, and um, I think we've done really well. But she won't be our friend on Saturday, anyways. And Chloe, just to touch on the growth of the league, have you seen any sort of difference differences like in say attendances? Have attendances been going up for you guys, and have you seen that across um, the away fixtures you've been at as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, even we were down in Cork City last weekend and there was a huge crowd there and it actually helps um a lot. Like and it probably even Cork were probably thriving off the crowd a bit down there as well, because it does it does make a difference when there's a lot of people kind of roaring and shouting in and stuff. And like I presume on Saturday there'll probably be a huge crowd there as well because it's such a, a big fixture. Um with the two clubs, obviously there's great rivalry there and stuff. But no, definitely there has been um there has been a huge growth in the league and it's it's great to see that there's there's more interest and obviously with Rovers coming in as well, they seem to be getting great crowds in uh in Tallis Stadium too. Um so hopefully it just keeps going that direction because it is great to see um and even like a lot of the men's supporters are showing up as well, which is good. Um and that'll help us as well. Chloe, what do you think that that kind of growth comes down to? Like, just there's a lot being made on social media lately about the Women's National League or the Women's Premier Division, as it's now called. Um, you know, Ireland qualifying for a World Cup, which is just around the corner as well. Surely all that's kind of feeding into a, a, a bigger picture here. Yeah, definitely. And I've I've mentioned this before that I think the girls getting to the World Cup in the summer has been absolutely huge in all aspects, uh, especially for our league. Um, I just think since they've qualified there's been just a lot of growth and stuff and like even I think young girls and stuff are starting to come out a lot more like you obviously see bus loads coming up to P-Mount from all different parts of the country like coming up to see our games and stuff and they walk out to the pitch with us and it's like the best day ever for them and that's that's great to see and I just think the crowds and stuff and there's been there's been more, a lot more interest. Like I'm from Clare myself, like, and there's just a lot more people asking me questions about soccer and stuff. And um, kind of where I live would be a lot of Gaelic football and stuff. But there's just kind of been more interest now since the girls have got to the World Cup. Um, and that's huge, like, and great respect to them for getting there. And just on obviously the standards and improvement off the pitch and people come to the games. Have you noticed in those different last, say, three to four years of the league itself on the pitch improvement? Have you noticed that at all? Yeah, definitely. And like, as I was saying about the other teams in the league as well, that mightn't have been doing as great like the last few years. It was kind of always three or four teams at the top where maybe a few years ago it was only two or three teams and stuff. And I just think that a lot of teams now have really, really improved. Um, Like they obviously have got players in and stuff like that, but it's just... There's nothing in between. There's nothing in the games anymore. Like it's just every game we play now. We know we, if we don't play to our best potential, we're not going to get the three points. So it makes it a lot more interesting and stuff. Like some maybe t- three years ago, you might have been 
able to kind of go in third gear in some games and get through them fairly handy but that's just not the case anymore and it's great like because um it makes it more competitive and stuff and like even this season like you have no idea who's going to win the league because it's just so tight and Chloe, what's your thoughts on obviously Shamrock Rovers coming into the league this year introducing semi-professional football to the women's game for the first time in Ireland surely that can only be seen now as a, as a, as a positive going forward and maybe the next five six years more teams will aspire to do that of course yeah and like that's what you want and you need as well because you've seen obviously all the top players that have left our league um over the last years like I know Piment have lost huge huge amount of top top players to go professional and obviously they have to go and do that that's such a great opportunity for them but wouldn't it be just so much better if we could keep them here and actually make our league amazing because if the, all them players were here like it would be even better um but it's completely understandable why they're going overseas and stuff but um yeah, if it could at all, even semi to start off, it would be great. Like, and Chloe, with so many like players um coming up now, young players as well. Who do you think is standing out this season? Is there any kind of young players you're looking out at, and um, what players are you kind of looking at yourself and thinking, oh, they're quite good. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um like even ourselves there. There's uh, uh, Jess and Ellen play with us they're, they're on the under 17s um, Ireland team and stuff and like Jess played in the six for us there against Wexford um, the weekend and like what a huge position to play in such a big game and absolutely just took it in her stride like no problems at all and the likes of them coming up like even Ellen came on in the last 10 minutes just when we needed to close out the game and she was holding up ball like someone that in their late 20s would do like and she was just so clever about it and they're huge for us because even in training and stuff they're constantly pushing us um and obviously you've other teams as well like Jessie Stapleton and stuff for Shelburne like she's like someone that's been around for years and years because she's just such a top class player um but yeah there's there's a lot of young players coming up in the league and they're probably what's making it so good because they're pushing the, the older players um for their positions and stuff like that. Love it. I think um, Ashley was hoping you mentioned a wet for youth player. I think that's what she was kind of hinting at there. <laughs> I better not say too much. <laughs> Any player Chloe know from Wexford that stands out? Wexford, um, of course there is. Wexford like are a very, very good side. Um, I know they've signed Emily Corbett and stuff this season and she was a nightmare for us last year playing against her. She was top class player and she obviously won player of the year but they, uh, they have Wexford have great squad and don't worry they're nowhere near done yet either they'll be there thereabouts at the end of the season um, but uh, there's I could sit here and talk about so many players in the league there's there's great young players uh, coming up but yeah and Chloe you mentioned um, just when we were talking about the growth and kind of the development of the league like you mentioned like kids coming up to you at, at home in Clare and stuff and asking about soccer like Clare not exactly a, a, a football and powerhouse um, but uh, you know that must be a pretty satisfying feeling for you personally yeah it's great because as I was saying like it's mostly Gaelic football around here and stuff especially where I live and just like not even it's younger girls and stuff and then even older people that wouldn't have had great interest in soccer like I can see now that they're turning on my games they're watching them on LOI TV and if we're on TG Car and stuff they're making the effort to watch it and that's huge like because that would have never happened five or six years ago. Some people around here probably wouldn't have even known I was playing for P-Mount. And I just think even the likes of TG Carrier, they're putting the games on and stuff. It makes such a huge difference because people are kind of like, oh, you know, if they're, they're on TV, they're probably doing really well or whatever like that. And it's just, it helps. And the LOI TV is great as well because people can watch the games. Obviously, it's a bit of a trek from here to Dublin, but they can watch them when they're on a Saturday evening. No, for yourself as well, obviously you're, you played two sports, you're dual star, you play for Clare GA as well. How do you balance that between playing for P-Mount and playing in the county football? Um, yeah, it can be tough. Um, but I'm mostly six nights a week um, with training and I have two matches in at the weekend most weeks. But um, probably the travelling from Clare to Dublin is probably the toughest part because it's a two hour, 45 minute drive. Um but I wouldn't be doing it unless I loved it. So, and I do, and I've obviously made great friends for life in Piedmont as well. And 
I'd never ever be able to choose between one or the other because I'm the same with Clare football. I have so many great friends there as well and I wouldn't like to let either team down, but it can be tough. Um, the main thing for me is just stay injury free as much as possible and then I can continue to play both. But um, it can be difficult. Um, it can be mentally draining at times if it's all great when you're winning too, but if you're losing or whatever's happening, it can be very, very tough. But um I really enjoy doing both and as long as I can keep doing it, I will. Is there ever a clash between the two? Is there ever a session or ever a case where you, you might have to make a decision between playing either sport or are, are you lucky in the sense where does there's, there's not really a clash? Yeah, I'm actually lucky enough because um especially this season, all the soccer games have been played, kind of moved to a Saturday. I know Treaty and Cork used to play on a Sunday, I think it was. Um, but now they're just all Saturday evening games. So I my Clare games are only always ever of a Sunday. So I've never actually had a major clash with like a Clare championship game and a league game for Piemont. Luckily enough, I haven't anyways. Um, so long may that continue. But I, I think I'm, I'm safe enough anyways because I've kind of got the fixtures for both. So it's just tough playing um, a Saturday and a Sunday because... Probably on the Sunday, I probably can't play to my full potential after playing the 90 minutes on on uh, Saturday. But look, I do my best and that's all I can. Yeah, and that's what was called my next question really was the the toll on the body. Like, is it, like, do you find yourself when you're mid-season for both, for both sports that you're you're physically drained or, or how's your body cope? Yeah, like, and I think probably mentally is a big thing as well to look after myself mentally and stuff because I'm doing so much travelling and, like obviously playing both sports. So I do look after myself well when I'm kind of out of sport. I just try to switch off completely um, from it when I have a bit of time off. Uh, but like, as I said, I wouldn't, I honestly wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be driving up that far if I didn't love it. And I do, and it can be tiring and stuff. And this season I've been lucky enough with injury, uh, thank God so far. But um, like, as I, on a Sunday, like uh, uh, for my soccer matches on a Saturday I'm okay because I don't play the day before that but on a Sunday it can be tiring playing the football Um, if I have a really really tough 90 minutes the day before and then obviously I have the bones of six hours of travelling to do on top of that as well going up and down so that can be tough but I do try to look after myself and my body as best as I can especially after a soccer game so I'm try- some bit ready for Sunday as well but both managers are very understanding as well. And if I do need a night off um, during the week from training or whatever it is, they're both very understanding and they look after me. And Chloe, like there's a there's a, a, an argument to be made about kind of kids when they're growing up playing as many sports as possible as it makes them kind of a more rounded athlete, I suppose. You're playing two sports at a, at a fairly high level. Um, do you think it's, it's beneficial to you that, you know, you're playing a lot of football and then you're playing a lot of, GAA like uh, across two weekends like is that making you a better a better athlete and a better sports person do you think um yeah like like whenever I'm speaking to kids and stuff especially really young kids and I have a little niece myself and I'd always tell her and young kids to just play as many sports as you can growing up because you obviously don't know exactly what ones you're going to like and stuff but try them all out as much as you can and the same with me like I was just complete Gaelic football growing up there was nothing else never I didn't start playing soccer till I was 13 and I had no notion of going playing it only for my dad basically made me go play he was like just go and have a trial and see how you get on and then ever since then I haven't looked back so just that's what I would say go play as many sports as you can because like I think the soccer would have improved me for the football and then the football would improve me for soccer because we probably do a lot more physical training in Gaelic football and that probably helps me a lot because I obviously I only make it to PMAT one night a week for training so when I have the Gaelic football training during the week it helps me and especially in the winter when we're doing probably a lot tougher training when I'm off season for Piedmont and that really really benefits me and if I didn't have that I'd just be training by myself and which is really really tough to go out and do by yourself so it's good to have a team um, that helps with that as well and then obviously with the soccer and stuff and just like when I was growing up and I was when I played underage with Ireland and stuff I would have learned a lot about kind of playing nerves and under pressure and stuff and I think that has helped me hugely with football as well and you said yourself so you you were kind of late coming into soccer and um, did you did you watch much of it when you were growing up or 
Um, yeah, I would definitely would have watched it. I'm a huge Man United fan, so I definitely would have watched uh, watched it on the television and stuff. And I probably would have played a small bit in primary school, but like I was just mad Gaelic football. Like it was just my dad would have played it when I was growing up and stuff. And I just see nothing else but Gaelic football. And then I started playing it then in my when I was in first year of secondary school, and that's when I got a trial then for the Clare Gainer Cup squad and kind of. I wasn't, I didn't, honestly, I didn't even want to go. I was like, I don't know anyone over there. I don't want to go. And then my dad was just like, you're going and that's it. And then that's where it all started. Not so, not so bad. So um, I suppose like what people talking about, you know, people want the league to move in a more professional direction and all that. But I suppose in a way you're lucky in the sense that it is where it is now. It allows you to play both. But if you had to pick one playing for Piedmont or playing for Clare, which one would you be picking? That's a terrible, terrible question to be asking me. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I can't really answer that. I just, I'll get killed from both sides if I answer that. Um, I've, <laughs> I've best friends on both teams. Um, and I honestly, I love playing with both of them. And that's probably what, like, people. If I could, if I got a fiver for every time someone told me I need to give up one of them sports, I'd be loaded. But I, I just, I, I couldn't. Like right now, I definitely couldn't pick. Um. It's just really enjoyable with both. Um, and as I said, like, I li- really do have best friends on both teams, so it would be fairly difficult. Yeah, that was a good answer. Sorry, I, ha- I had to ask you. <laughs> you've, done, you've done a great job there with a political answer there, Chloe. Um, <laughs> now, look, you've, you've been great time. There's a couple more questions. Um, I thought we were chatting off air, just briefly about, like, obviously, for the, the open kind of podcast for the season, we were giving predictions and female maybe are on the decline or whatever case and it kind of got a a bit of a traction that you were asking it, it, it did it, it wasn't unnoticed in the the female dressing room um yeah it uh, rings a bell all right but um listen there was a that probably wasn't the only one i've probably seen hundreds of tweets about us when obviously the girls left us and when shamrock rovers were coming in i think a lot of people talk we were going to fold as a club and I don't really know where that came out of because that was never ever the case and to be honest for the last few weeks of last year's season we kind of knew that the girls were going and stuff um, which wasn't ideal for us either trying to win a league but that's just the way it went Um, so there was never ever any ever any doubt of P Mount United fold and I don't know where that came out of it was kind of to be honest it made us laugh really in a few group chats and stuff like that but uh yeah, it probably actually drove us on more, if anything, and it brought us together actually really tight as a group. Um, and I, that group of girls that I'm playing with now, literally every single one of them would die for each other and including the management as well. And there's just a great, great bond there and obviously led by a great captain as well with Karen Duggan. And her being loyal to us as well was just massive at the time when when I seen uh, that post of her going up, signing back as captain for Pima was just absolutely huge for the group. And like, there's just nothing but respect for her. And as I said, she's a great captain and we'll do what it takes. Just following up what you said, it was interesting, just we're talking about last season, you kind of knew, you knew some of the players were leaving. Like, how, how does that affect the dressing for yourselves? Like, it, it, you know, do you think that had an effect on the running for yourselves going for the league? Um. I don't want to make an excuse for kind of coming up to the end of the season with us probably not winning it or whatever, but like it wasn't nice really to kind of know that and stuff. That stuff was kind of going on behind the scenes. I think it should have just been left till the last day of the season was over and because there is plenty of time in, you know, the end of November till January to sort all that stuff. So it probably would have been more ideal um, to leave it till after now. I know it probably wasn't coming from the girls. They probably didn't want that to go out and stuff, but everything kind of gets out, doesn't it? So um, it wasn't ideal, but that's just the way it was. Now, it wasn't spoken about or anything. Like, we just got on with things, but it just probably wasn't great that we kind of knew about that before the league was over. Looking ahead then to Saturday, well, we mentioned Iran playing Shamrock Rovers. Um, big game. Like It's obviously one of those games you're, you're just really looking forward to now at this stage. Yeah, that's it. And... um. Like as their new team in, and they obviously have really, really good players. Um, they'll be coming to try to get the three points, and obviously we will be as well. Um, like we have to respect them as much as we can because they've signed a lot of good players, even from Shelburne as well. They've got great players. Um, but we'll just have to perform to the best we can, and if we do, I think it'll be good enough to get the three points. But time will tell. 
And I'll hit you for a score prediction. Uh, uh, I'll leave it tight. I'll say one one nil for you, Matt. <laughs> one nil. Okay, cool. <laughs> Playing Graves, playing title to coming on, and good luck for the rest of the season. Thanks, Thanks really. Bye. Yeah. And there's kind of a lot of grumbling about maybe we don't have enough Premier League players, but in terms of the Championship, as a... But what's the point in grumbling about it? But the step I, can, I can't hold about it, can I? If, if they're not playing the Premier what's the point of me grumbling? But the step up to international football from the Championship, is it kind of... Is it easily managed? Well, I'll tell you about when we played in 2002, and what's, what's the point of like grumbling? But we had lads who were all at the bottom of the Premier League, real scrapping away, Kins and Matty Holland and... Uh, Gary Breen, who hadn't even got a club. What's the point of grumbling? So, I, I don't subscribe to that, you know, you just... Whatever it is, whatever I've got, I'll get them together and make the best of them and try and make sure we qualify. Grumbling is not one of the things I do. You can subscribe to each new episode of the Extra Time Time.ie Sportscast on iTunes. Please give a rating or add a comment there to let us know your views. What's the point of grumbling? Welcome back to the second half. Donald's still alongside me. I'm delighted to welcome on Mullenbeck, centre back Jake O'Brien. Jake, how are you? No, I'm good. And yourself? Yeah, not too bad. I suppose they're probably a cracking. Great win the weekend. Yeah, no good win. Um, it's kind of comfortable, but it's, it's a win we kind of need. It takes us in and it kind of keeps the momentum going going into the last two games. Yeah, and so no, great win. As we were just chatting there off air, like, you know, it's going well this season, any of the team in general, like, you know, very close promotion. Yeah, I mean, very close team. I mean, all the players are close together. It's a very multi- multicultural team. But uh, well, it's a close bond, which you know, it helps us really. And in terms of the, the league system, we were just chatting there, it's it's, it's a it's a split after the second round of fixtures, you were saying? Yeah, so everyone plays each other twice. Um, and then that brings you up until about February time before the season, uh, the league is split in two. So there's the relegation playoffs and the promotion playoffs. Um, you keep your points that you've that you've ended with, but um, you play the top six uh, two times, so it takes you another ten games. Um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna it's difficult to get your head around with the start, but just the way it is up there. Yeah, and you were just mentioned there about the the dress room itself. It's very multicultural. Is there such a is there a language barrier or anything like that with yourself and the coaching team, or um, is everyone kind of speaking English? Uh, no, the most the uh, most used language would probably be French, but we have a lot of lads from Brazil that play at me as well. So they most of them won't have much English, so they kind of speak in Portuguese. But then we have coaches and physios that kind of speak three or four languages and kind of do the translating for team talks and such. But yeah, the manager can switch between French, Dutch, English, so um, no helps. And then the other coaches speak Portuguese, so kind of going back and forth. But that's we've kind of found a way of communicating with each other. And Jake, I see you're not the only Crystal Palace man that's on loan there as well. Luke Plange gone over as well. Did you go over together? Yeah, no, we went over together. Um, kind of first off, we we came over for a day just to kind of get a glimpse of what it was like over here and the the club facilities, and then just have a, a few meetings with the coach and to see what the ambitions are for the season. Um, and then obviously both of us signed there. Um, but then Luke went back in January. He went back to. To League One to finish the season out in England, whereas I stayed and just um, yeah, stayed and put for promotion. How, how's your French? French, no, not <laughs> great, no, no. And um, Jake, how exactly did the move to Belgium come about? Like, you know, I mean, is this like there's a lot of Irish players kind of moving further afield in Europe? Like, was that something that you saw other players doing and you were kind of like, oh, I'd fancy a bit of that? Or like, you know, a move to Belgium kind of seems like a little bit of a bit of an abstract one. Yeah, I mean, at the start, I was kind of looking about doing, uh, sticking out my loan in England. But then um, Mark Bright, the loans officer at Palace, uh, just rang me up and said there's an interest from Olin Beck. Um, and then there was obviously that connection with John Texter, who owns the two clubs. Um, and at the start, I was kind of thinking, like, it's a, it's a bit different to uh, going to another country after he was coming here. Uh, um, how will that affect my development? Um but then, as I said, I went over and had a look at the facilities and chat with the coaches. And, you know, that kind of pushed me over the line, really, of coming here and just seeing what the club's about. And um, yeah, even even the fans there are all close to them. They're, they're really good. Must be a bit of a kind of similar feel to the League of Ireland, so if the fans are that kind of close, like... Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're crazy. Um, 
players going off. They just just chanted the whole whole ninety minutes, giving it like, and yeah, no, it definitely helps us on the field as well. Now that they're behind us. And obviously, you know, moving into the Belgian second here, I can't imagine you knew too much about Malenbeck before you went over. <laughs> no, to be fair, I didn't. Um, I obviously done a bit of research myself. Kind of looked into it. Um, obviously, I know a few teams in the in the pro league, but it wasn't something I've looked at because um, it, it just came about as a shock, really. But to be fair, now I know everything about every team in this league, the the one above me as well. So. No, it's, it's a shock, but I think it's it's worked in my favour coming in as well. Have you noticed any major differences between, say, playing League One last year, Swindon, and uh, playing now in the the Belgian second tier? Is there any difference in terms of maybe is there more possession based, say, Belgian? That be kind of my guesstimation. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's similar to kind of the Dutch league. Um, a lot of it's kind of quick ticket tack of football on the floor. There's not much. You don't you don't see the ball in the air often. It's not kick long. It's um it's kind of it's nice to watch, kind of quick. Um and then there's there's players from all over really in this league, from all over the world. So it's a multicultural league as such as well. But yeah, no, it's good football to watch. It's a lot different to the back in England in the lower tiers. Um, it's kind of like I say, yeah, as I said, same to Dutch football, Dutch and kind of the Belgian football are kind of the same really. Just nice on the floor kind of football, fast. And how did you find then when you're making your debut in the first couple of games? Did you find yourself acclimatized to a quick, or did you have to adjust, or what was the transition? Uh, to be fair, I, I didn't, I didn't um, find it too hard. I kind of, I actually came on my, for my home debut here. I came on up top. It was only like a two, uh, what was it, seven minute cameo or something. Uh, I managed to come on and score, um, to, to score to make a, a draw. And um, no, it's kind of just thrown the deep end, really. But then after that, I was put back in the natural position and kind of just grew from there. And now I've gotten used to it, the, the tempo and everything. It's, and it's definitely helped my development. And Jake, would you be open to kind of staying on the continent or maybe like moving to maybe maybe staying in Belgium or another club in kind of mainland Europe? Or is getting back to England really the goal for you now? Um, to be sure, I'm very open minded. Kind of just see what comes in, uh, what's an offer, and then kind of weigh up the the, the options as such. Um, for next season, I can't really go into too much, but like there's there's a lot of options. But then going back to England could be a, a good option as well. So uh, I think yeah, after the season's done, I'll sit down and have a chat and see what's um, what's been said, and then uh, yeah, we'll go from there. But uh, at the end of it all, like this experience in Belgium will certainly stand to you. It must have been a real eye opener for you for what's out there in terms of your career as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I think not even for me, but for other people to just look beyond, look beyond England. There's there's more to it. There's more opportunities out there in Europe. Uh, um, not even just the Belgian leagues, but the the French, the Spanish, the Italian. There's so much out there, and um, it's it's different to the English football too. There's different. Uh, the speeds are different the type of football is different and it's something that you can add to your game and it helps you as well Off the pitch how would you find the adjustment moving abroad and obviously you're playing the UK but obviously people know it's kind of similar to Ireland in terms of the, the language barrier like you mentioned how yeah. you found going further afield in the Belgium was, was it difficult or did you find it quite easy settling in um, I mean at the start I was going to hotel hopping but then I, I managed to find the place to settle down right in the, right in the city centre um, my girlfriend's moved in with me as well so it's kind of it's easy to have each other as well but I mean not everyone has really friendly um, nothing's too far away from each other it's kind of it's a small country really so you can go to Paris even is an hour and a half Amsterdam is an hour and a half the other way um, so yeah you're kind of in the centre of everything really um, so yeah that's good you think it's maybe put too much pressure on yourself now scoring your debut with, with playing a front like what <laughs> there did you kind of go I might have set the fans up for fall here uh, just the fact that I came up front I was kind of thinking <laughs> oh geez if I playing up front there it could be a problem back at Palace um, but no I was, I was just thought because it, it was we were 2-1 down I, I'm obviously big as well so I was kind of just put up there as a target man just to hit long um, for the last few minutes and kind of just walked out really fell to me I scored and Jake just kind of looking back on um, going to Palace like from Cork it must have been like Maybe not a surprise, but um, you know, it must have been like when you look at the likes of the caliber of player the Palace 
uh, produce out of their academy. You know, their academy is probably regarded as one of the best in England. I know it's, it has a pretty high standard in terms of where it is with UEFA as well. Like it must have been a pretty big feather in your cap to seal a move to Crystal Palace. Yeah, I mean, growing up, it was always something I wanted to do to move across the water. Um, so when that came about, it was kind of a dream come true, really, to come over. Um, I came over during COVID as well, so everything was kind of shut down as such. And the academy was in a rebuild phase. So six months I was there, it kind of changed, a lot changed. And we went from the Cat 2 to the Cat 1. Oh, well, I wasn't there when it was a Cat 2, but we went to Cat 1, and then we progressed from second division to the top one. Um, so yeah, a lot changed in the small time I was there, but yeah, that's definitely one of the top academies, not just England but New York as well. I think I think the players that are coming through are, are top as well. And a lot is made of you know, there's an argument to be made for players maybe coming back to Ireland and playing like at men's football as they say. But the step the step up from the League of Ireland into kind of like a more prestigious academy like that must have been huge. Um, yeah, I mean it's. it's it's, it's a lot different. I mean, academy football to playing men's football is is different. Um, but then when you kind of go into an academy like Palace, it's kind of a very tactical and still about your development as well, and trying to get you trying to get the best out of you to, to eventually get you into the first team. Um, whereas I, I suppose back in the league of Ireland, when you're in the first team, it's just about results, really, just like any first team, really, just about getting results. So it's from going from that in a re- relegation kind of challenging thing uh, to Palace back to kind of development phase. It was different, but I think it was something that I needed and um, that was worked out as well. And you were saying, is Mark Bright involved with this setup, Jake? Because I know he's a bit of a Palace legend. Yeah, yeah. So Mark is ambassador of the club, but he's all, he's also the loans officer. So he, he'd come over for a few games and he makes his way around to all the players that are on loan. And he just he'd give you a call after the games and give you feedback. Um yeah, but he just takes show with all the loans and he does the commentating as well for Palace Palace games for the Academy. So he, he gets through, he does a lot as well. And how exactly did the move to Palace come about, Jake? Uh, so it kind of came to the end of the season and obviously I wanted to go I wanted to kind of just fulfill my dreams and go across the water. So kinda of, I was always on the phone to my agent, kind of seeing what's about. Um, and then Stephen Rice was over there. So obviously there's that Irish connection. And um, my agent was back and forth with him. And then they invited me over in trial, um, as in December. Uh, so I went over and played two games, just as a trial kind of thing, for like I was over about 10 days. Um, and then the, the, the day life of saw. And then as I was going to go over and sign, there was kind of issues just with signing there from um, Cork City and whatever. So I signed initially on a loan to Dubai. And then within maybe is it a three weeks to a month of me being over there on loan, they triggered the option and I, I just stayed at full time. And how did you find the 23 football, Jake? Because obviously we're playing over here with Cork, playing the first team, then making the move over to England. Did you find 23 football a bit different? Because some people say it's kind of lifeless or... Sometimes the attention maybe not as high as whatever the case would be. People are going to complain about it. What was your own experience of under twenty football? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of talented players there, obviously, because some of them play first team and just drop down or whatever. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's no atmosphere kind of because it's academy football, but uh, it's something you don't you don't want to be you don't want to play too long. Maybe a year or two is the most you want to be playing at it before maybe going loans or going to a first team somewhere but it's definitely something you need to do to make that step um, but there's a, there is a lot of talented players in, like you play against the top academies and you're you're challenging as well to win them leagues it is competitive but it's diff- it is different with kind of they're trying to develop you as a such to it's not just about winning games all the time it's kind of a mix but um, you know there's a lot of people be watching to try to get you on loan in the games so it's important to to perform as well and Stephen Rice is heavily involved with the twenty three setup, isn't he, at Palace? Yeah, he was, and then he's he's obviously head head um, head scout now at Ireland. But uh, no, he was there for the first year I was there at Palace. So yeah, he was a big help of some Irish there. Even though the manager now at Palace twenty ones well, was Paddy McCarthy before he made the move up to Palace first team as well. So there's there is Irish connections there. 
did that help with the in the moving over to the UK, first time leaving home, going over to England and having familiarity there, even, even though you don't know them, but the two Irish staff kind of heavily involved with the self? Yeah, I mean, some someone to relate to really. Um, kind of get each other, you know, the Irish banter, which a lot of English people probably wouldn't get. But um, no, it's good good to have them. Um, and he kind of just put me aside and helped me develop as well and gave me a few pointers as well, which stuck by me as well. How did you find the jump in standard from, say, playing National League with Cork in your first season? Then obviously going over to Palace and, like you mentioned there, some obviously quality players don't touch on one of the top academies in England. Did you find a, a, a big jump or an initial, initially tough to start or how did you find it when you went there? Um, it is different, but I think I kind of... I was it was good for me so that I played first team football before going to the twenty threes, whereas a lot of them in that league haven't played first team football, so they don't have that kind of physical presence or that kind of will to win because it's academy football. Whereas I was kind of just kind of brought my from what I got from Cork City, I have to win, have to win, have to win. Um, and Palace, I think Palace liked that that I and it helped as well for when you're going your first loan because I've already played first team football. Whereas if you haven't, then some some teams if they want to take you in they're kind of like oh he hasn't played so it's a bit of a bit of a um, a risk but not for me it, I think it definitely helped me as well playing in the league of Ireland before moving over yeah you just touched on it there about, about Cork like the I suppose the thing that stands out in my mind was the COVID season obviously Cork went down and obviously being a local lad yeah. from the team like how difficult was that in your first season obviously the great experience to get the league of Ireland football playing first yeah, team yeah. football and then obviously Cork to your relegate in the same, which kind of shocking to most fans in the league. Like, how difficult was that in the change room? Uh, yeah, no, it was hard. I mean, I only moved into the, the second half of the season, but I mean, we we're kind of rock bottom as well. And there was a lot of change in, in coaching and managers. As I said, I went through about, I went through, was it three managers, two or four managers? So it was kind of that the atmosphere wasn't the greatest at the same time, and then there was true COVID, so there wasn't a, there wasn't the atmosphere that to turn us cross either to help us, um, and as well because it's I think Cork City are definitely one of the biggest clubs in Ireland, so they shouldn't be in the second division. Um, but yeah, well, so that's the way it is really, isn't it? And when you're growing up, did you did we in turns cross much growing up, and like do you see much now the team obviously getting back to the Premier Division this season? Have you seen much at all? Uh, no, I definitely watch it. Um, I have it on my box. So I watch most of the games really when I when I don't have a game myself. Um, even growing up, I've been to a lot of the games. Um, even in in the summer when they play preseason games against Premier League teams, I I, I was always there growing up, and I always wanted to, to play there. So no, definitely another dream should come true to play for Cork City as well before making that step over England. What have made their start the season so far? Sorry. What have you made their start to the season so far in, in the Premier Division? Um, it's been a kind of the rocky start, but um, I think they might turn things around. They should. I, they have the players to do it. I think it's just a bit of luck here and there, but I think I think it will turn. Um, I mean, when it gets midway through the season, a lot can change. Um, but it is, there's a lot of good teams up there. I think the the standard in the league for them is is definitely getting a bit better. Um, so it's just about getting up to it really and Jake just talking about standards there I mean you're obviously part of the Irish under 21 team I mean like minutes away from getting to the to the Euros there recently like you must like playing with kind of players that are playing all like across there's players in that team that were playing all over Europe really and um, that must have been a great team to play in and you were very unlucky not to make the European Championships yeah I mean we had players from all over, as you said. Um, it was a close into the team as well. I mean, everyone was very close to each other and helped on the pitch as well. Um, it was good and not to, to make it through because I think we we had the team to do it. Uh, we had the players to do it. Um, maybe a few results here and there, draws and defeats kind of let us down when we could have maybe got got a result there. And then obviously in Israel, when we lost in penalties, that was good because... I think we, even when we played them in Ireland, we probably should have got a lot more from it um, than we did, and we kind of left it left it a bit hard for us to do over in Israel. And obviously, you talked about Israel there, the leg that was played in Ireland. Evan Ferguson got the goal there for Ireland. Yeah. He's he's kind of risen through the ranks fairly quickly, but like just from the brief time you were playing with him, could you kind of see how how high his stock was going to rise? 
yeah, I mean, it's no shock to see what he's doing. Um, I think all the players can say the same. Is 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 going to happen eventually? Um, I think it's just when you play with him, you don't realize how young he is because he's just he's so mature and he's big for his age and and um, tactically and technically so good. Um, so it's just is it was about time he's it was um, gonna all click from. And I'm I'm delighted for him to be to be doing what he's doing. And when you see Ferguson make the jump, you've seen other players, even Will Smallbone, you're playing with in the campaign. Is, does that give you kind of the, the optimism or the hope that, when, you know, if we keep playing the football here, getting first few minutes, that the opportunity might rise for himself? Because like we all know Stephen Kenny is very much in favour of picking youth and that hopefully will lead to international calls for yourself. Uh, yeah, well, I think when you when you look at what they've done and um, you kind of relate it back to yourself, it just, it just puts into perspective that if you, if you start playing good in the level then you will get your chance um, I just think if I keep going up the levels and doing what I'm doing then eventually I'll get what I want as well Well uh, yeah good option off the bench scoring goals from up front for a few minutes that's, the, that's a decent way to <laughs> you never know you never, yeah you never know never know <laughs> and just like finally before you wrap up like obviously two games left of the season it, it's so close now to get promoted like it, it, it's always just it's nearly there if he's this stage yeah, I mean, we're only one point ahead with two games to go. Um, the must win games, really, because I think Wazen and Beveren, who are just one point below us, will probably win their last two. So it's important that we get these two out of the way and get six points from six. Um, and then it'll be huge for the club if we do it. I mean, and for the fans, because I think they deserve it for the amount of work they put in. And uh, it's been many years since they've been in the top flight. So I think it's, it'd be an honour to, to help put them back into where they should be. Well, Jake, good luck for the rest of the season and thanks for joining the podcast. We'll chat soon. Well, thank you. And before we wrap up today's show, there's a quick run through the fixtures this weekend in the SSE our Twisted League, starting with Player Vision, Shells Cork City, UCD Bowl, Dundalk Drada, Derry St. Pastelic, and Shamrock Rover Sligo all on Friday night. There's also a round of fixtures on Monday on the bank holiday, starting with St. Pastelic, Sligo Rovers, UCD Dundalk, Bowls Cork City, Derry City, Shamrock Rovers, and draw the United against Shelburne. In the first division, we have Bray, Waterford, Tree United, Kerry, Dolly United, Cove, Ramblers, Athlone Town, Wexford, Finn Harps, Longford Town. And same again, like the Premier Division, there's a round of fixtures on Bank Holiday Monday. Waterford, Wexford, Bray, Tree United, Longford Town, Galway, Cove, Ramblers, Kerry, and Finn Harps, Athlone Town. And lastly, in the Women's National League, we have a round of fixtures. DLR Waves, Galway United, Sligo Rovers, Athlone Town, P Mount Shamrock Rovers, Cork City Bowls, and Wexford Youths Shells all on Saturday afternoon and evening. And make sure you tune in to the XTime.com Voice Notes podcast, Ocean Lang, which will be released Friday night, Saturday morning, which will have immediate reaction from around the grounds on the Friday night games. I want to thank our guests this weekend, Chloe Maloney and Jake O'Brien. Thanks to Donald and Lashling. Thanks to you for listening, and we'll chat to you all next week.